just want to uh, briefly introduce the topic and sort of how I came to uh, start talking about some of this work. So um, for a number of years, I was working at a startup. And uh, the startup, we had a software platform. And uh, a huge amount of the value proposition was based on artificial intelligence and machine learning. And uh, I was a designer, a user experience designer there and a product manager. And I started doing a lot of work with our data science team. And when I ran into problems or when I wasn't quite sure how to approach researching a particular problem, I would go to some meetups in my community and I would ask for some advice around best practices for designing for machine learning features or products. And a lot of the answers I got when I was trying to ask around with, through my peers was they had a lot of experience with analytics products in general, but not necessarily predictive analytics. Um, you know, putting together an analytics dashboard, but not necessarily looking at something where you're trying to convey that you're predicting a future outcome. And so uh, I got a lot of sort of half answers where they said, well, you could try this, but I'm not quite sure. And then that was when I really decided I'll just try to figure it out on my own. And then when I get a little bit better, I want to try to distill what I learned into something I can share back with other communities who might be doing similar work. And that's where uh, a lot of this talk came from. So a quick introduction to me. Uh, I don't know how many um, data scientists or developers we have in the audience. Um, I'm actually not a data scientist nor a developer. I'm actually a designer and a product manager. But I did work with data scientists every day, and I worked pretty closely with them. We actually had an in-house data science team of about five people, and all of them had PhDs in computer science and economics, and they had three different screens, and they're always running so many different tests. And I was the one who sort of went around with my sticky notes, and I asked a lot of questions, and I drew a lot of things. And we were able to find a way to work together better. And so that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about today. Uh, just before I get into um, the agenda for what I want to cover, um, I typically do a quick terminology cheat sheet, but I actually think that the tweet that Jesus showed did a much better job of explaining that. So the one thing I will say briefly is that um, in industry, um, one method of applied machine learning is sometimes called by executives at a company as predictive analytics. And predictive analytics, um, it's a, the best way I would describe it is um, you have some kind of product offering and you're trying to predict the future. Um, you take all that data, you use machine learning methods in order to get some insights, and you want to offer some prediction of how an outcome might turn out. And so I'll reference some of these phrases a few times. So when I say that, that's what I'm referring to. So uh, for today's agenda, what I want to briefly go over is first an introduction to why I think this matters. I think I want to not only talk about why it's important for us as an industry to start learning a little bit more about where machine learning can go wrong, but also about the other disciplines um, in the technology industry that should have a seat at the table. And somewhat in, this might be somewhat biased on my end since I am a designer, I really do believe that design has a unique perspective to bring to the table and that um, if designers work hand in hand with data scientists and data engineers, we can really build products that not only look cool because they're using the latest technology, but they're actually very valuable for end users. So I'll talk briefly about that first. And then I'll talk about three different lessons that our team learned as we were working on designing machine learning products. Uh, so a quick preview here is um, the first is less is more, the second is ask the right questions, and the third is writing well matters. And a lot of these lessons learned um, actually draw from different disciplines within the field of user experience, which is quite broad. Um, so different specialties and concentrations within that field that um, hopefully you can learn a little bit more about and also includes um, uh, in the slides also include some names of resources that you can look into if you're interested in learning more. And then finally, I really believe in learning through examples and through uh, stories. So I'll tell you a story of how these lessons learned played out when I, my team and I were working on redesigning a feature within our product specifically. So you'll be able to see some of those lessons learned in practice. And hopefully at the end, we'll have some time for a few questions. So um, going back to why uh, this field is important, why it's really important for designers and developers and everyone in this field to be involved in a part of this process, 
Um, I think it goes without saying that everywhere around us today, we see more and more systems that are powered by artificial intelligence. Even if it's not necessarily very apparent to us or communicate to us as a key part of the value proposition. And when I first started working on uh, machine learning features and machine learning products, I would sometimes meet other designers through design professional associations. And sometimes I would talk to our clients who were, um, a lot of them were lawyers actually. And they would ask me questions like, oh, so you work at a company that does predictive analytics, that does artificial intelligence work. Uh, like, do you think these algorithms are going to take my job? And I always laughed <laughs> because I said, uh, well, I don't know, I just met you, so <laughs> I don't even know what your job is. But um, after I heard a couple of different people ask me that question, I really started to think about it. And I put together some initial assumptions and hypotheses. So I thought to myself, as, um, uh, so I'm from the US, and as the US moved from uh, having a very heavy manufacturing industry to having now more um, service industries, there were a good number of jobs that were eliminated as a part of that because of um, machinery that helped in the manufacturing center. And so I thought to myself, well, what jobs are not at risk of algorithms taking over and what jobs are? And uh, my first thought was for something that's not at risk, uh, it has to be a job that requires a lot of creative problem solving, potentially a lot of education. Surely there must be a few positions or professions that are not at risk. And the first thing that came to my mind was maybe doctors, maybe doctors are not at risk. And I did some research and it turns out I was wrong. Um, and one of the things that came up in my research was actually an article that came out in the New Yorker. And this article was called AI versus MD. And it basically posed the question, what happens when machines can outdiagnose doctors? So they ran a study and they gave uh, a bunch of images um, of patient, patient x-rays, I think, and uh, they showed them to um, a sh machine and they also provided a small data set around what those diagnoses were. And then um, they were able to run a model and try to figure out um, through this machine if they could figure out how likely they were able to diagnose something correctly. And then they gave those same images to a group of board certified physicians and they asked them to do the same thing. And it turns out the machines were more accurate than the board certified physicians. And if you think about it, I guess it makes sense. Even if you're a physician, if you've been practicing your whole life for many, many years, you see hundreds, maybe thousands of different patients um, of different images and you can learn over time to diagnose them quickly. But if you give this image to a computer, they can see millions and they can see it in such a short amount of time. They can learn more quickly. But another unique thing that they found in this study was that it wasn't enough for part of the patient experience just to know what they were diagnosed with. So you think about the patient experience um, where you go to the doctor, and you talk to them and they t you tell them about your symptoms and they'll ask you a few questions. A doctor will ask you follow-up questions like, is there something that changed in your life recently that would have introduced a lot of stress to your life? Um, they might ask questions like, did you move recently? Uh, maybe there's something about the environment around you. And uh, a machine wouldn't really do that. So you could have a more accurate um, prediction, but it's a black box. You don't know why that prediction came to be. And for a lot of people, that not knowing why actually makes them a little bit uncomfortable and they feel more reassured and they trust the experience more if they can talk to someone and really try to understand why. And uh, reading about that actually brought me to thinking about some of the work I was doing. So I was working at a business to business enterprise software as a service uh, startup. And so we made software that we sold to other businesses and part of that software suite, we offered predictive, uh, predictive analytics features where we would predict the future outcome of how likely a piece of legislation was to become law. And the thing was, even though we offered this and it was quite accurate, uh, people always wanted to know, well, how did you get that number? How can I make a change? Um, and while we could explain it for an individual one, if there was a human showing this product to them, it was really hard to do that explanation at scale. And around the same time, a couple different venture capitalists started writing about this issue. 
they started talking about the trend of different bigger uh, software companies like Salesforce launching um, a, a feature called Salesforce Einstein, I believe. And what they really asked was, not only will your users trust this analysis, but will they pay for it? And that's, I think, maybe the ultimate measure in business if someone really trusts it, if they're willing to pay more for it. So I'm gonna go into that a little bit later when we talk about um, some specific examples. But keep that at the back of your mind in terms of um, the relevance of uh, machine learning in the context of software development. Um, before I go into uh, something, some of the projects that I worked on specifically, I actually just wanna take a brief moment to reiterate the role of design as it comes to developing products with emerging technologies. So I think it goes without saying, there's a lot of thought leadership out there that artificial intelligence will transform our industry, um, probably not even our industry, but industries across all of society. It will increase the intelligence of our civilization a billion fold, according to this one inventor. Um, but I think the really potentially uh, important impact of artificial intelligence is when you think about it being used not only to make businesses make more money, but also to make um, our society function a little bit better. There's a woman who uh, started an organization, I think it spun out of MIT Media Lab, and they're trying to apply artificial intelligence not only to improve computational intelligence, but also emotional intelligence. So they have a couple products, that are tr and they're running um, a few studies to look at uh, helping autistic children better better recognize and build relationships and emotions um, with their parents, which is something for a parent of an autistic child, something they might not have realized was possible um, to use artificial intelligence to um, get better at. And then um, for me personally, I've been thinking a little bit uh, about this and then also talking about it with some of my colleagues in the industry. Um, we wanna think really critically about how artificial intelligence, uh, we can think about it very critically so that we don't accidentally use it for something that is actually more harmful to our society. So uh, there was an investigative report that came out by ProPublica, I think maybe about one or two years ago. And there are now a couple of different uh, counties across the US where they're using uh, software programs that were developed by some technology company. And this software program essentially predicts how likely someone is to get rearrested. Um, but the problem is they only ask certain questions. So they'll ask questions like, do you have a family uh, member who has been in jail before? Um, questions that really are biased against people who come from different socioeconomic backgrounds. And uh, they explicitly didn't um, factor in race as a part of their algorithm. But because of that, um, because of that not including that, it implicitly did, um, if, if you looked at the numbers, it did develop that algorithm so that someone who is white is less likely to, uh, is more likely to get a lower score, and someone who is a person of color is more likely to get um, a higher risk score. Um, and, uh, and so because of this, I think it's really critical for um, all of us in this room, as we develop new technologies and think of ways to apply artificial intelligence, we really think critically about what factors that were uh, keeping in um, and considering and what factors we're excluding as well, because we don't want to accidentally use uh, machines to perpetuate human biases. So uh, now that I've talked a little bit about the importance of thinking about design and um, in the context of artificial intelligence, I actually want to just share a little bit about the lessons that our team learned as we were developing um, a couple of different machine learning features and products. Uh, before I go into that specifically, maybe it, it would be helpful for me to uh, give a little bit more context um, for the company that I worked with uh, for some of these projects. So um, some examples of features in our product that included um, different types of applied data science uh, were, um, I mentioned before, we had a predictive analytics score that showcased the likelihood of a piece of legislation becoming law, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. We also had a feature that looked at um, different comments, uh, different amounts of text that were submitted by organizations to the government, and uh, using natural language processing to analyze the sentiment um, and the uh, sort of positivity and negativity um, sentiment uh, in that text, and then if that organization su supported or opposed a particular regulation. 
And then we also developed a prototype of a conversational voice assistant where you could interact with um, a voice assistant within the app um, of our product and also ask a few basic questions like, what is the status of something? Who is the most effective person for me to reach out to on this issue? So that's just a couple um, of the products that we worked on. So when I talk about some of these lessons learned, they're in the context of features like that. The first thing that we learn um, actually comes from the field of data visualization. And there's a lot of great resources out there if, um, as your uh, as you're experts in data science, but you want to learn a little bit more about data visualization, there's a lot more that you can learn out about this. So the way that I learned this was I had to really think not only about the end user in terms of who was using our software, but also the end user in terms of my colleagues internally. So I'm a designer, and I work with a lot of data scientists, and most of the data scientists I worked with uh, maybe a, a little over half of them had PhDs. So they had a slightly different academic background than I did. Um, and it took me a while to think about what someone goes through in order to get a PhD, right? You go through many years of school, you have to show your work all the time, because if you want to publish in a peer review journal, you have to share your methodology and you have to share your data set. Um, and so every time I was working with my colleagues and we were prototyping different ideas and talking through them, I never really understood why they always wanted to go with the really complicated graphic until I really thought about you know, what background they were coming from. Um, they were coming from a uh, perspective where uh, you know, when you're in grade school and you're in math class and you're solving the math problem and your teacher tells you it's not good enough to just tell me the answer, you have to really show your work. That was the perspective they were coming from and they were really bringing that into um, the way that we were working together on design. And so uh, it really took bringing them along with me as we were doing user research to show that sometimes showing too many numbers was very overwhelming for our users. And I, I think almost all of our users did not have a PhD, so they didn't really need to see all of the work that was happening behind the scenes. And so in our case, we realized very quickly that we wanted to offer that solution, but then the evidence only for the people who wanted to find it later. The second thing we learned came from the field of user research. So the th second thing we learned was to ask the right questions. When I first got started doing user research on machine learning products, there was no book out there for me that sort of talked about this very specifically. How do you test something that uses technology that may or may not have really passed some tests yet? Um, and so I was kind of figuring it out as I went. And there were some questions that I could adapt from doing user research on other features and other products in our portfolio. Um, and other questions that I kind of just thought, well, I want to get this answer, so maybe I'll just ask this question this way. And it really took some trial and error to figure out how to ask the question the right way. So when I first got started, I would ask questions like, does this make sense? Or do you like this? But this was actually a little bit too leading because it's human nature to want to please the person you're talking to. And I realized very quickly that the person I was talking to, they kind of guessed I was the one who was working on the thing I was showing them. And they probably didn't want to hurt my feelings and tell me they didn't like something because they probably guessed I had been working for four months um, at work on this. And so I realized, OK, that wasn't the best way to ask the question. Then I tried going with very open-ended questions. And generally in user research, it's really good to ask open-ended questions but you have to ask them the right way. So when we first got started, we would ask questions like, well, what would you do next? Or what would you call this? Because we had all these fun features that used all this applied machine learning technology, but we had no idea how we wanted to market it. Uh, and when we asked these questions to our users, they actually got really nervous. And you could, we could tell that they shut down a little bit because they felt like they were being tested. And more importantly, they were being asked to do a job that wasn't really their job. I mean, the people we were talking to were lawyers, and they don't sit around thinking about how they're going to call a machine learning feature or something. And so to ask them a question like that when it wasn't their job to was actually pretty confusing to them. Um, but one thing that we realized was we really wanted to ask some of these questions in a very situational context. And we wanted to think really deeply, well, what do we want to get out of this answer? What's the thing that we really want to take away? And how can we ask the question in a different way to invite people to really open up? Uh, one insight that came from our previous user research was for our particular users, there was a good amount of turnover in the organizations. So 
it was very likely um, that some of them would occasionally have a team member like cycle in and out of their team. So instead, we asked them a question like, imagine you had a new coworker who just joined your team. They had never interacted with our product before. How would you explain this to them? And that kind of phrasing really resonated with them. It put them in a situation that was familiar to them. And they were able to answer the question because when they explained how they would explain it to a coworker who didn't know, they were essentially telling us what they would call this. Uh, but the most important thing we learned was to listen to the questions that they asked us. And I'll talk about this a little bit later. Uh, one tip for if you're conducting user research on this is I would, at the start of a user research session, for if you're testing a machine learning feature, or even just in general for user research, just tell them, you're going to ask me some questions, and the first thing I'll do is I might ask you a question back. So you might ask me, oh, and can it do this? And I might ask you, oh, why are you asking me that? And it's really important to tell people at the start of the session, because if you don't tell them that you're going to ask, respond to their questions with a question, they'll feel like you're really annoying. <laughs> and you just tell them, I promise I'm not trying to be annoying or try to, trying to frustrate you. It's just because we learned so much from the questions you asked them, and we promise we'll answer all your questions at the end. And people really tend to respond pretty positively to that. Um, and then they remember in the middle when you answer their question with a question that you aren't trying to frustrate them. Uh, the third thing that we learned around designing for machine learning products was that writing well really matters. And uh, I know this probably sounds overwhelming because earlier this morning you heard a little bit more about some of the other technical skills um, for you know, the intersection between data engineering and data science. But writing is actually a really important skill for if you want to make sure that you're applying your technology to something that people will use. Um, for myself specifically, I uh, have always told people that if I weren't a designer, I'd want to be a journalist. Because I think to myself, you know, the jobs aren't too different. You spend a lot of your time trying to define a problem, going out talking to strangers, and trying to draw insights from them and get their stories. And then you try to synthesize all of what you learned into some kind of artifact. As a de designer, that's usually a journey map, or it's some kind of design within a product. And as a journalist, that's typically an article. So I thought to myself, oh, this is great. This job now requires writing. I'm going to really channel my inner writer. Uh, and when I first started writing, I realized that very quickly, this wasn't really an opportunity to showcase that I could be a staff writer at, say, The New Yorker, um, because the audience, for me, didn't care about that. They were using their, our software for their job, and they wanted to complete their tasks efficiently, and they wanted just enough information to make a decision effectively, but not too much flowery language. So um, the general uh, framework I suggest people to go with is to first spend time just on a, on a piece of paper defining who your audience is, what your purpose is, and what your user's purpose is when they're using your product. And that'll really help you clarify what your brand um, sh voice should be as you're talking to them. And so sort of speaking of brand voice, another thing I learned through trial and error was when I first started writing a uh, copy within the product, I would, I would let my personality come out. So my personality when I'm writing is to typically be very quirky, very fun. Um, but I realized that you know I thought about it for myself. And the best content strategy and UX writing that I've seen, which is where a lot of this, um, these resources can come from, uh, when I use a product and say their offline function doesn't work, it's sometimes a little condescending to see something that's too fun, like, oh no, it doesn't work. Um, it's not really always the most welcoming thing to see when something doesn't work. You really want some troubleshooting tips or something like that. And so what I did was I would first write something in the way that came naturally to me, and then I would quickly go back and audit it for the brand voice. So for a lot of our users who are lawyers making, using our software to make very big decisions for their company, um, I thought, OK, I need a more serious tone. But I'll first write something in a way that makes sense to me, and then I'll go back and try to make it sound a little bit more serious. Um, and then going back to what I said before about data visualization, writing is also an opportunity to really offer the solution first and then the evidence later for those who seek it. And if you're interested, here's a couple other resources you can take a look at for 
um, you know, getting a quick introduction to the fields of content strategy and UX writing, which is where this lesson learned came from. Okay, I'm just gonna take a quick water break. Okay, so um, now that I told you a little bit more about some of the lessons that we learned, I wanna just briefly highlight uh, a brief case study that we worked on. So uh, really quickly, our design process um, looks something like this. We spend a lot of time defining the problem and coming up with solutions and testing those solutions, whether it's a paper prototype or an interactive prototype, before we even start to build something. And I also wanna say what's really important in this process is that um, during this design phase, um, we, I personally would invite engineers and data scientists to part of these ideation sessions because I think it's really important that their perspectives are included um, and they're a part of the design process early on. So if you have a chance to start prototyping different designs for different machine learning features you're thinking of building, make sure to spend some time um, coming up with some of those prototypes before. And when I say prototype, I mean like a design prototype. So something where you might be sketching out a couple wireframes on paper and showing it to people or building out something high fidelity but not necessarily writing any code yet. So uh, this is an example of one of the things that we redesigned where we applied some of these lessons learned. So this is a screenshot of the original design for uh, the predictive analytics score in our software. Most people had a really hard time understanding this. They understood it when someone from our company was standing right next to them or over the phone explaining what it meant. But when they started buying the product and using it day to day, they could not figure out what this meant. Uh, for the record, what it says is this bill has a really high chance of getting to the floor, but a so-so chance of passing once it gets to the floor. And that distribution chart over there is showing um, in this particular state uh, a 95.6% 95 chance is good or bad, depending on what the distribution of scores is in the state. Um, makes a lot of sense for someone who has a very good background in statistics. For someone who doesn't, they thought it was actually a, um, a graph of how the score changed over time. And that makes sense because there's a lot of graphs that look like this that are about changes over time. The key to us figuring out how we wanted to redesign this was actually what I said earlier about listening to the questions that your users asked us. And this also ties back into the story I told you about um, how this is relevant in the field of medicine. Everyone always wanted to know why was the score this way? Was it because of the language of the text? Was it because of the people who were sponsoring the bill? Why does something higher or lower? Um, and why did all the reasons look kind of the same? So uh, there, if you see on the bottom, there are four different reasons for why you might have a score like this, but a lot of the language was either too vague for someone to really understand what it meant, or they said to themselves, well, I saw that explanation, but it was on every single page, and they all had very different numbers. And what we ended up redesigning it to was related to something related to some of the lessons learned that I talked about. We actually hid the numbers so that the very first thing you see is actually essentially what we realized people wanted to know. So when they called someone on our team to ask them to explain the score to them, what they really just wanted to know from that chart was compared to other piece, uh, bills in this state, this was much more likely to pass or less likely to pass. And that was all they needed to know to make a decision of how they wanted to allocate their resources. Uh, we gave um, explanations for why something was much more likely or less likely, and we try to adopt a more conversational tone because we realized that for some of them, the charts were very intimidating and they were distracting and they couldn't make a decision very quickly. And also around this time, our company strategy actually changed. So it was a little bit hard at first to advocate to our executive team, our senior leadership, that we should even redesign this in the first place. So uh, at the time, our pricing strategy such, was such that there was one tier of our product that didn't have analytics and another tier that did. And the one that did had, was cost a lot more. And so redesigning something that was a huge part of that much higher tier was actually putting a lot of 
uh, risk on the table for changing something that people were currently paying a lot more for. We, were, we wanted to change the pricing model such that people paid more depending on how many people in their organization were on the platform, which was more consistent with what our users believed the value proposition of our product was. Um, one of the ways that I tried to make this case to our senior leadership for why we should redesign this was I did a quick search on an internal drive and I found over 140 documents that outline how these scores work that were created by employees for other employees. And I showed that to one of our leadership team and I said, if we can even help our own user, our own employees understand this, how can we expect our users to? And after that, they said, okay, you can try redesigning this. After we were able to run several versions of this prototype test with a couple different designs, uh, everyone could concisely articulate how they would explain their scores to their coworker. So I said earlier that one of the questions that we ended up settling on to try to decide whether or not we should move forward with certain changes was imagine you had a new coworker on your team, how do you explain it to them? Over time, as we tested different versions of the design, we saw people become more comfortable articulating how they would explain it and also articulating something that was more accurate to what the product actually did. So just to quickly recap, uh, the three lessons that we learned today related to designing for machine learning products are one, less is more, and sometimes it's good to hide the numbers. Uh, two, you want to ask the right questions, but more importantly, listen to the questions that users are asking you. And three, uh, writing well really matters, so if you haven't written um, in some time, now's a good chance to brush up on some of those writing skills. We also talked specifically about a case study here uh, where sometimes like a really fancy chart um, and all these fancy graphics that you can use a lot of the latest front-end technology to build, um, sometimes that's not what people need, and what they really need is just a couple sentences that explain something to them. We learned that it's important to adapt your skill set um, if you are afraid that algorithms might take over your job. And that most importantly, um, the key to building trust with users when it comes to machine learning is that why often matters more than what. You could have a very, very uh, accurate algorithm that predicts the future very accurately, but if you're not able to articulate why you're giving that prediction, people might not trust it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Crystal. Uh, we have uh, some time for one or, two, uh, one or two questions. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, preguntas, preguntas para Crystal. Hi. Um, I just have a question uh, regarding your product. Uh, you said that you did a, ma a major redesign based on the feedback from users that they were, they were complaining about not understanding a score. Yeah. Um, so how did you manage to get that data back? Uh, you had user groups or something because I think it's really important to get data back from users, but that seems like something that they were going into your app or website, I don't know what it is, yeah. uh, and just saying, okay, I don't understand it. Or, <laughs> or was it just like direct feedback to your sales team? Yeah, so um, we actually over time built out uh, a pretty robust way to get user feedback through a number of different channels. So anytime we start new product development, we always reference um, like a, an, a hacked together database that we built, which was really just getting our sales team and our account management team to forward information to an Evernote notebook that we could search terms in. Um, and so the feedback from our sales team and our account management team, they would actually um, have something set up in Salesforce so that it automatically got forwarded to a place. Um, some of the different departments where they were collecting feedback use different technology, different software platforms, so we wanted one place to aggregate it all. Um, and then in addition to some of the feedback that we got sort of indirectly through other departments, we also did a lot of qualitative and quantitative research just on the product and user experience team. So we had uh, a couple platforms that we use for tracking user behavior. Um, we uh, use um, Segment and Mixpanel and a couple of different analytics tools in order to look at the hard numbers for where users were going and the different conversion funnels. And then we also use another platform where we could essentially record some user sessions to get a more qualitative look at one individual's individual user's journey. And then um, 
And then for uh, sort of outbound user research, we had a small like user group that we put together. Um, you know, we called it like a customer advisory board, and we wanted to make sure that our users were felt like they were a part of this group because they were lawyers, and I think that was the best way to get them to participate and also encourage them, like, if you participate in this, you can network with some of the other users because they're very big on networking. Um, so we had some in-person sessions where we would bring them in for lunch and then show them some things and then just start an informal discussion. And then we would also schedule one-on-one -on -one time with individual people. Um, we would go to their offices, maybe show them a few prototypes, or just sit down in a coffee shop with them and talk to them. So. Um, it's a lot, but um, I think the biggest thing that I learned from all of that was that it's really important to have both primary feedback and secondary feedback. Primary because the people, the users who are most likely to come to you, they're gonna give you all the information. But you're also only going to get the users who are kind of like, you know, the kind of, like, the kind of person who like, if they don't like something at a restaurant, they would send it back and complain to the server, or like they would call customer service and like yell at them. Not everyone's going to do that. So you have a lot of users who like secretly are frustrated with your product, but they're not the type of personality who would reach out to you. So the secondary research was really helpful because each of those people had an account manager, and the account manager would specifically ask some questions. So it was a way to sort of reach people who had different personalities and varying uh, proclivities to sharing their opinions. <laughs> Crystal, I, th I think that's... Yeah, we don't have we time don't have for another question. Questions. Yeah, sorry okay. about that. <laughs> Thank well, you so much, you can also, um, you can also tweet at me, um, and if you go to my website, if you poke around a little bit, there's actually a link where you can email me, too. Thank you very much, Crystal. Thank you. Another round of applause.